Hello and welcome back. Let's talk about capacitors today. These are some of the most common components in electronic circuits next to resistors. But how well are you actually simulating them? I mean, if you're performing a simulation and you got a bunch of capacitors, if you're not modeling these components correctly, then you will not get correct results. Let's start off by performing a small experiment. So what I got here is a simple low pass filter. I'm generating an AC signal, passing it through a resistor into a capacitor. Now if we simulate this, we're getting the textbook behavior of the low pass filter. Basically after a certain frequency, the filter is starting to filter. So any frequency above this corner frequency is being attenuated by a factor of 20 decibels per decade. Now, let's just see this circuit in practice. Let's see this behavior in real life. So, to test things out, I got this little experiment going right here. So, I'm generating a signal from the signal generator, passing it through the amplifier, and then it gets into this little circuit. So it comes in through the connector, goes through a 1 ohm resistor, and then into a massive 4700 microfarad capacitor. And then I'm using two probes to probe the input signal and the output. So the yellow will be the input, blue will be the output. Let's see how this thing works. So at very low frequencies, input signal, output signal, completely the same. Let's slowly increase the frequency and see what happens. So I increase the frequency up to 50 Hz and we can already see that the output signal, the blue one, is starting to be smaller than the input signal. Let's continue. So increasing the frequency some more, we see the low pass filter in action. Output smaller amplitude than the input. Perfectly normal, just like we simulated. Now we're at 1 kHz, the blue signal is starting to be too small to make a proper reading, so I'll just make some corrections here. So basically I got the same signal, just messed a bit with the second channel's input parameters. Right, so right now I'm at 50 millivolts per division. Now if we continue increasing the frequency, we will see that after a certain point, the amplitude no longer decreases. So at 2 kHz, 5 kHz, 10 kHz, the blue signal is roughly the same. So the filter is no longer filtering it. And if we increase some more, so right now we're at 100 kHz, still roughly 60 millivolts peak to peak on the blue signal. So not much is changing anymore, it's constant. And if we continue increasing, we will notice a new phenomenon going on. So the output signal is becoming larger and larger. So completely counterintuitive with how the filter should be working. So slowly the filter is losing its filtering abilities. And with increasing frequency, this is becoming worse and worse. So what's going on? Why is this circuit not behaving like the one in the simulation? We must be missing something. And if you're curious what that is, then keep watching. So the first thing that we're missing can actually be found in certain data sheets. So what I got here is a data sheet for an electrolytic capacitor from Kemet. And if we scroll down through this document, we get to the table of actual components. And here if we look at the 4700 microfarad 63 volt capacitor, so this is not the one that I used in my experiment, but that doesn't really matter. We see that one of the parameters in here is this one, the maximum ESR, or in other words, the maximum equivalent series resistance, which is about 89 milliohms for this sort of capacitor. Now what is this ESR, so, or what does it represent? Well, if we look down in this data sheet, there's a very nice drawing here of how an electrolytic capacitor is actually built. Basically, you've got your two electrodes separated by an insulator, and these two electrodes are made from aluminum. Now, aluminum, just like any other conductor, has a certain resistance. And basically, this is what that ESR represents. So the ESR is the equivalent series resistance of the plates 
terminals and whatever goes into building a capacitor. So let's just see how our circuit behaves if we include into it the ESR. So we already got a bracket for it built in from LTSpice and we can simply write 80 milli. Let's see how this acts. So we got our reference behavior and by including the ESR we can see that the filter is filtering until it's not. And then the response becomes flat. So just like we observed in our real circuit. Basically the ESR works like a resistance in series with our capacitor and no matter how low the impedance of the capacitor becomes, you're left with a voltage divider built with your real resistance and the ESR. And the output cannot go below a certain value. And this is exactly the behavior that we see here. Now if we quickly go back to our drawing, we can notice another thing. So these electrodes don't just have a resistance, they also have an inductance just like any piece of wire. And in the case of the electrolytic capacitor, things are made worse by coiling these up. So the two electrodes are wound up in a coil so that everything can fit into the box. And this coil adds a bit of inductance. And if we go back to our simulator and we also add inductance to the equation. So here I've got a capacitor that only has capacitance and a bit of equivalent series inductance it behaves something like this. Now if we compare this behavior to our reference capacitor, we can see that in the beginning the behavior is exactly the same, then we have this dip, and finally the output starts to increase with increasing frequency. So basically this explains why our filter was starting to slowly lose its properties. This inductance was becoming the predominant source of the impedance. Now if we put everything together, so capacitance, resistance and inductance, we get this component. And if we simulate this one, then we get this behavior. So exactly what we've seen in our experiment. After a certain frequency, the filter starts to attenuate the input signal, then it stops, the output signal becomes constant, and then the output signal starts to increase with frequency. And basically, these are the three main components of the real capacitor. Or at least these are the components that you should use in a model. Now, of course, LTSpice has a few more components present in its base model. So we got our series resistance, capacitance and series inductance. We've got the shunt resistance that accounts for the losses in this series inductance. So this is not an ideal inductor, this has losses. We've got the parallel resistance. This basically means that any sort of energy stored in the capacitor gets lost over time. So this is what you use to model that the capacitor will lose its charge in time. And then you've got the parallel capacitance, which is basically an ideal capacitor placed in parallel with this thing. And basically this is how the basic capacitor model is presented in LTSpice. Now, coming back to the inductance, how do we find this in a datasheet? I mean, normally it's not really present, but sometimes you do get an impedance curve of the capacitor. And what I got here is the online datasheet from a capacitor from Morata. And among other things, we get this frequency characteristic curve. Basically, it's the impedance of the capacitor in a frequency range spanning from 100 Hz up to around 6 GHz. So how can we extract some parameters from this thing? Well, first of all, let's see how we could generate this curve. Basically, the impedance of a capacitor is its resistance in AC. So not in DC, but in AC. And just like Ohm's law is valid for DC currents, the same law is valid for AC currents. So to generate an impedance curve, you can use a setup like this. Basically, you need to inject a current into a capacitor and then measure the voltage on it. And the impedance will be the voltage divided by the current. In this case, the current will be one, so the voltage will be its impedance. Now coming back to the curve. So for the capacitor, we know the capacity, which is 4.7 microfarads. For the impedance, 
we can simply take any point on this graph, let's say this one, and calculate the inductance. So at this point on the graph, the major contribution to the impedance is coming from the inductance. So we need to see what inductor generates 1.7 ohms at 1001 megahertz. So the inductance will be the impedance divided by 2 times pi times the frequency which will be 1001 megahertz. Yeah, I think that's enough zeros. And we get this number which is basically 270 picohenry. Now the resistance we can get from this point. So when you get the resonance frequency of the capacitance and the inductance, the impedance of the two elements cancels out and you're left with only the resistance. So if you get the impedance at this minimal point, this will be basically the ESR. So we got 6 milliohms. So basically I filled out my capacitor like this. So 4.7 micro farad capacitance, 6 milliohm ESR, 270 pico ESL. And the others aren't really mandatory. So let's see what we get. So if I plot out the voltage, at the moment I'm getting my scale in decibels, but we can change this to a logarithmic scale, so it's much more easier to see. We can divide the voltage by the current, and now if we scale things a bit, we get a pretty similar curve. So my simulation is going up to 10 gigahertz, we've got this little bump at the end. But other than that, the two measurements are pretty similar. They're not identical, they're similar. So how do we get this exact curve? So the one that the datasheet is giving us. Well, fortunately, Morata are some really nice guys, and they provide simulation models for capacitors. And the model looks something like this. So it's huge. It's not just a capacitor in series with a resistance and an inductance. It's around 20 components. 20, 30, I didn't really count. There's a lot of them. Now if we simulate this thing and compare it to our original simulation, we can see that we're a bit off. We're not getting the right impedance at resonance, the capacity is off, something's wrong here. I mean, it's Murata, these guys know electronics and they know capacitors, so I'm guessing it's not the model that's wrong. I must be doing something wrong. Let, let me just get back to you, this isn't right, this, no, 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 it's not, not supposed to be like this. So after a bit of searching, I found out something very nice about LT Spice. So when talking about these three components, if you open up their menus, you will see that you fill in the value of the resistor for the resistor, the value of the capacitor and some other things for the capacitor, and the same for the inductance. You fill in its inductance and everything else is blank. Now for the inductance, and it only seems to be for this one, you have this little fine print. Basically, the program to ease simulation adds this 1 milliohm of series resistance. Or in other words, all of the inductors that are present in this model have an extra milliohm in them. And this is what's breaking the simulation result. Now there's two ways of fixing this. First way is to specifically write in the model that each of these inductors has a series resistance of zero. And if we do this, and re-simulate, so this is our basic model that we put in the three components, this is the broken one, and this red one is the one with the corrected series resistance. And now you will see that the capacitance is okay, we get this little dip at the end, and then the inductance is okay again. So basically by correcting the resistance, we are getting this sort of behavior. Now if you want to work with a bunch of models, Doing this is not really practical. So the next best thing is to go into the control panel. So under the tools menu, the control panel, under hacks. So I'm not sure why they put it here, but whatever. And here we have this setting. So always default inductors to R series equals zero. So basically we click this. Also supply minimum inductor damping. No, we don't want this. And now if we simulate again, 
we will see that both the models, the one with the correction and the one without the correction, have the exact same impedance. And the green one is the one that we started off. So basically our green approximation was not extremely accurate, but good enough for most cases. Now, this model, though really complex, is missing a few things. If we go to the original file, there are a few things mentioned here. So we got our model, and we got some text that nobody ever reads, or at least I don't. Basically, it tells us who is providing the model, what is the component it's for, what's the base capacity, when it was generated, and then this is the most important part. So the applicable conditions. When is the model valid? So basically it's valid from 100 Hz to 6 GHz, perfect. Temperature of 25 degrees only, and DC bias voltage of zero. So what does this mean? Are these good conditions or not so much? Well, let's quickly go back to the datasheet. So if we go through the curves again, we will see the temperature characteristic curve. So how much the capacity will vary with temperature. It's not that much. So in this case, let's say we can neglect that. And we also get this curve, the DC bias characteristic. How much will the capacity vary under various DC voltages? And this we can see that it has a significant influence on the capacitor's properties. So this model, though very nice, it's only nice under certain conditions. Let's see if we can find a better model. So what I got here is a model made by Chemicon, this time, so a different company. And this is for an electrolytic capacitor. Now what's special about this model is that although it's not very complex, it only contains like seven components, it covers three different temperatures. So this model, actually there's three models here. There's one for the capacitor for each of the temperatures the model is covering. So for 20 degrees, minus 40 and 125 degrees. Now in the case of electrolytic capacitors, the main thing that will vary will be the ESR, the equivalent series resistance. So let's try this model out. Basically what I got here is my measurement circuit three times, once for each temperature, and I'm again injecting an AC signal. So let's see what happens. So we can see the behavior at 20 degrees, at minus 40, we can see that our ESR is much higher, and then at high temperatures, 125, the ESR is lower. So we can see that the capacity doesn't really change, this being an electrolytic capacitor, the inductance doesn't really change, but the equivalent series resistance does change. Now, this is a very nice model. It covers the basic parameters of the capacitor and its temperature behavior, but it's not really doing something quite well. And that is, if you want to make temperature simulations, you don't really want to change the model every time you change the temperature. So how could you include all these three models into a single model? Better yet, how could you simulate a different temperature than the one specified? Well, LTSpice has this nice function. It's called the table function. Basically, you can use this to insert some input data based on an input parameter, which is X in this case, and then LTSpice will provide you either the values from the table or any sort of interpolation in between the values that were provided. Or in other words, what I got here is a capacitor in which my input value is the temperature and then my table consists of this. So at minus 40, my capacitor should be one micro. At 20 degrees, it should be 0.5 microfarads. And at 125 degrees, it should be 0.1 microfarads. And now if I step the temperature from minus 40 to 125 with these intermediate values, then we get this behavior. So we have five different curves because we have five different temperatures. And for each of these curves, LTSpice took a value for the capacitor from my table. And when it didn't have the values, it just interpolated them. So let's expand this concept to include all these models. And we can create this sort of model. 
basically I took the data from all the components and all the temperatures of the base component and added them in this table shape. So basically for minus 40 I added the values that were provided for minus 40, for 20 I added the values provided for 20 and likewise for 125. And this way I created a model for the capacitor that works at any temperature between minus 40 and 125. So if we measure it, we get something like this. Five different curves for five different temperatures. Just to make sure that everything is correct, we can check it with the base models. So if I now highlight the 20 degrees model, we can see that it's exactly the same as my tabled model. If we check minus 40, again it's the same. And also we get our intermediate temperature values. So this model will cover also temperature. Now there's one thing still missing. Remember that bias voltage parameter? Well, I managed to find a model that covers that also, but I can't really show you. The reason is not that I don't want to, but I can't see it either. This is the model that I will be using. So it's created for a specific capacitor, and it's applicable for wide frequency range, wide temperature range, wide bias range. But it looks something like this. This is what an encrypted SPICE model looks like. Basically, it's what you do when you don't want other companies or pesky YouTubers dissecting your work. So let's see how it works. This time I will be using a voltage source rather than a current source so that I can specifically say that it has zero DC bias voltage. And I will be plotting the current, but not directly, but in reverse. So the impedance is the voltage divided by the current. Voltage in this case being one. So we get this curve. Is it good? Is it bad? Let's quickly compare to the datasheet. So the manufacturer has their website. And if you download their characteristic data, you get something like this. So this is the datasheet of the capacitor we just simulated. Now if we compare the two, there is a slight difference. So the ESR is roughly the same, the impedance is roughly the same on each side, but you don't have this thing. So these little bumps. Now, at the moment I used the simple model. Samsung is nice enough to not just provide a simple model, but also a precise model. Difference being that the precise model is much, much bigger. So if we try out the precise model for the exact same component and again plot the reverse of the current, we see that now we have exactly the behavior we see in the datasheet. So all of these inflections are present in the precise model. Now this model doesn't just have the impedance at 25 degrees and zero volts, but this model also claims to have temperature behavior included and DC bias voltage. Let's just try that out, make sure that it's true. So we were simulated minus 40, 25 and 120 degrees and see how the impedance changes on the precise model. And we see that it doesn't have a very big influence, but it does have some influence. And this is exactly what we're expecting. So we can see that only the capacity is affected, the ESR stays roughly the same and then the inductance again is not affected. So this is probably good. But now the tough question is, how will this behave under various DC bias voltages? So I've included this statement to step my DC bias parameter from zero to 50 volts in steps of 10 volts. Let's see how that goes. It's going really slowly. So since this model is so complex, simulation is taking a while. What we're expecting is to see that capacitance changes a lot. So as we can see in the data sheet, it should be highly voltage dependent. So simulation finished and we can see that the capacity has indeed changed quite a lot. Also we see some interesting behaviors going on. So all these spikes were not there at the beginning. The various resonance frequencies moved around. So the precise model is giving us a very detailed picture of how this capacitor is behaving 
at different bias voltages. But wait, there's more. There's one more thing I need to tell you about capacitors. So this is basically the most complex model that I found. It's giving you some quite interesting results. But LT Spice actually offers us one more way of defining the capacitor's capacitance. So until now, we used the standard capacitor model. But we can also use this way of expressing it. Basically, rather than expressing its capacitance as a value, we can express the charge of the component. Or in other words, something like this. So if we simulate these two circuits, I'm currently using a sine wave, 1 kilohertz, 1 volt, 2 volts peak to peak. And we can see that the capacitance is giving us a certain current through the circuit. Now the component on the left side and the component on the right side behave exactly the same. Difference being that here we've written that its value is 1 microfarad. On the other side we've written that the charge is the voltage x, voltage on the capacitor, times 1 microfarad. So basically these are two ways of writing the same thing. So what's the point? Why bother with this thing? Well, the advantage is that with this expression, we can change the capacitor's value during the simulation. So not just stepping the value between multiple simulations, but actually changing it during the simulation. For example, we can use this sort of formula in which the capacitor's value changes depending on the applied voltage. So if the voltage is larger than 0.5 volts, then the capacitor is only 500 nanofarads. Otherwise, it's one microfarad. So here we can see the voltage, and if we look at the current, we see that there's a spike at the beginning, which is giving us some problems, but we can change our scale a bit, and we can see this behavior. So based on, based on the applied voltage, we see that the capacitance is changing, and this is having an effect on the current going through the capacitor. Also, we can not just change the value based on the voltage applied, but based on outside parameters. Like we have here. Here, the capacitance is changing based on time. This is giving us this sort of behavior. Basically, as the capacitance rises, so is the current. So here we see a slow increase in current. If we simulate this for longer period of time and a lower frequency to actually have a faster simulation, we can slowly start to see the effect of the sine function. So basically, the capacitor's value is changing based on the sine function, slowly increasing and then decreasing. And that's about it from my side for today. So hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos and hope to see you next time. Bye bye.